Ladies and gentlemen, good uh, afternoon and welcome to the last uh, lecture of this cycle of joint uh, lectures uh, Geolog SP Italy. This last uh, lecture uh, is dealing with a very hot topic. Uh, I would say that is a hot topic for two reasons. The first one is that uh, is dealing uh, with the petrophysical analysis that is a, 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 a not an easy task. And the second point uh, that is uh, making the, 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 say the matter more and more complex uh, is dealing with the petrophysical analysis uh, on, uh, on cuttings. So the possibility to use cuttings uh, to get uh, petrophysical data is a, a very difficult uh, and hot topic for the oil industry that is taking uh, less and less course in, in uh, while drilling. Uh, the, the lecture of this evening, of this afternoon, uh, should be given uh, by Professor Roberto Simonuti and uh, Michele Mauri. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Roberto Simonuti has a, a health problem, so he cannot uh, give uh, his, uh, the, the, part, uh, the part of his lecture. So the whole lecture will be give, given by Michele. We thank Michele, obviously, for being here and for giving uh, both parties of, <laughs> of the presentation. Michele uh, Mauri uh, has a PhD in a very hot topic, another hot topic of, of this, in this day, that is nanostructures uh, and nanotechnologies. <coughs> it is, is, a, is, a, is an emerging topic that is becoming more and more important of, also for the oil uh, industry. And uh, he has uh, been working at Connecting Academia in material science and the R&D requirement of companies. He has an experience in Germany as a postdoc in a German university. The university is Martin Luther University yeah. in Halle, if I, yeah. if I remember correct. And uh, uh, now he's, uh, he's uh, at the University of Bicocca in Milan. He's also co-founder of a couple of spin-off uh, with uh, Professor uh, Simonuti. So he's, uh, he's not only involved in academic, thi in academic things, but also is uh, working uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, bringing uh, the technology to, uh, the, uh, to the industry, to the market. His main interest, uh, scientific interest, uh, are in uh, polymers uh, and, uh, and polymer and material characterization with a, a strong uh, focus uh, on uh, porous media. So in po porous media for oil industry is obviously a very hot topic. He has uh, published uh, many, many uh, papers, uh, uh, peer-reviewed. I'm very happy to see when uh, peer-reviewed, because I think that nowadays peer-reviewed uh, papers are very important, uh, and uh, we need more peer-reviewed uh, paper. So I leave the floor to uh, Michele, I thank you again for being here, and uh, let's learn about uh, petrophysics on cuttings. Okay. Uh, no, I thank you for the very kind introduction, and uh, I thank SPE for the opportunity to present uh, my work also on this topic. <coughs> so, uh, as 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 has just been told, I'm Michele Mauri, I'm postdoc at the Department of Material Science in the University of Milan Bicocca, which you can see here. Uh, my focus is mostly on uh, uh, man-made materials, so artificial materials, but uh, many of the characterization techniques uh, can of course work also on uh, natural materials of interest for uh, hopefully for the, uh, petrol, uh, for the oil industry. So, um, let me start with, uh, by explaining why the S in nuclear magnetic resonance is uh, for petrophysics. Because uh, um, many of you, maybe somebody here or somebody uh, online, has already had the opportunity of working with NMR. So I tell that uh, it's um, not a single technique, but rather a large family of techniques, uh, which uh, include uh, uh, especially 
high resolution solution NMR, which is uh, uh, very hot in the um, pharmaceutical industry, for example, or uh, in general in characterization of single molecules and in chemistry. Uh, maybe somebody has used has worked in the little bit more exotic uh, solid state mass NMR, which is um, an NMR which can be applied also on solid state, and uh, where some people also perform uh, uh, NMR crystallography. Or uh, uh, I will also, uh, but I will put uh, most of the focus on low field uh, time domain NMR, uh, which is something which I've published some of the papers that were just cited, and. Um, and somebody maybe has also worked on ima NMR imaging techniques, uh, which I will not cover here. So, um, the general basis of all NMR techniques, uh, the underlying physics, uh, is that we are working on intrinsic uh, nuclear pro intrinsic properties of the nuclei. So, uh, the word nuclear should not make you think of uh, uh, active, uh, mm, ra of using radiation or stimulating radiations uh, or using uh, uh, high energy rays. We are using, uh, uh, we are exploiting general properties which are, um, pertain to the nuclei themselves and which do not require special preparation. So, uh, as I summarized, nuclei always possess charge. As you know, they are made up of uh, protons, neutrons, and uh, uh, so they are basically charged. Sometimes uh, they also possess uh, a nuclear magnetic moment. This is not true for all nuclei, unfortunately. For example, the very important uh, carbon-12 isotope has uh, no nuclear spin, so uh, it cannot be used for nuclear magnetic resonance. Instead, we will focus on uh, nuclei which possess a spin number which is different than, ze uh, than zero, which can be one half or more than one half. The case of uh, uh, high spins uh, uh, with spin numbers equal uh, uh, to one or more is also quite complicated because they are quadrupolar nuclei and I will also not cover them. I will focus with, uh, uh, on nuclei which have a spin number of one half and namely the proton, uh, the single proton, so the hydrogen nucleus and Xenon 129, which also happens to have a, a um, quantum spin number of one half. I also cited the very important carbon 13 because even though uh, not as abundant as carbon 12, it can also be used. So, um, some more physics, uh, not too much, hopefully. Uh, the other, the, the important uh, and the necessary thing for performing NMR is uh, uh, an external magnetic field. Because uh, in presence of an external magnetic field, uh, by Zeeman effect, uh, the different uh, um, energy levels associated, uh, uh, actually, the different levels associated to um, spin one half and minus one half are actually uh, actually present an uh, energy difference and uh, this difference in turn uh, creates uh, by Boltzmann effect an imbalance in population and ultimately a magnetization vector, macroscopic magnetization vector associated to the sample that you are putting inside uh, uh, the external field. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, magnetization vector is the one that can be manipulated to uh, extract information about the sample. Now, without going too much into the physics, I will just state that uh, uh, after having uh, moved uh, this magnetization vector from the equilibrium, uh, it will slowly go back, uh, usually producing oscillations, a decay, and uh, of course uh, an, uh, a signal intensity. I will try to um, explain how these three things can provide information on uh, uh, samples of petrophysical interest, starting from the easiest one, uh, that is the intensity. So, um, let's start from the 1H nucleus, uh, which is uh, the most ubiquitous that we can have. And, uh, namely, it is present both uh, in uh, water and uh, in all hydrocarbons, uh, which makes it, uh, I hope, uh, very interesting for the 
uh, oil industry. Since it is very abundant and also very responsive to NMR, uh, it is easy to measure also with benchtop NMR instruments, uh, one of, the, of whom I am presenting here, the Minispec M MQ20, which I used uh, in uh, most uh, of my experiments. And uh, as you can see, sample preparation is quite easy. Okay, here it's depicting uh, an oil. Uh, you just put uh, uh, the sample inside an NMR tube. It's a 10 millimeter tube. So you need usually one gram or, or less uh, of uh, material, which means that uh, it's very compatible with the kind of uh, amounts that uh, you have in, uh, uh, you, you can extract from, uh, uh, well, from, from, from uh, drilling uh, operations. And um, here I will show the most basic, uh, uh, the most basic uh, possible NMR experiment, which is measurement of uh, signal intensity as function of water inserted in the tube. As you can see here, as the signal, uh, as the water volume increases, the signal increases linearly. Okay, so uh, this very basic application is in fact um, present in this paper that I've cited uh, here as calibration. So what did they do? The authors uh, calibrate and then uh, they use this uh, curve to measure the amount of water present in their own samples. More of this later and. Uh, um, so, I presented that when you increase the amount of water, you increase the signal. But uh, there is also another very similar application. So, when you have a fixed amount of material, if you increase the percentage of protons, you increase the signal, again linearly. This is the basis of this ASTM method, which, you, uh, which is um, defined for the measurement of hydrogen content in aviation fuel. Hydrogen content uh, is uh, connected to the amount of saturation in the fuel and so to the energy it can produce. And uh, as you can guess, it's very important uh, if you really want uh, the plane to fly. And um, again, the hydrogen content at a fixed amount of sample is connected linearly to the signal. So, what, uh, how does uh, the oil industry come uh, in? Because uh, what you do, uh, now this is what you know much better than me, you can uh, extract cores, you can extract cuttings, you can extract uh, uh, lots of different kind of samples from drilling operations and uh, how I see them, I see them as complex systems in which you have parts of rock, of rock constituted for example by grains and part of vacuum which is filled by water or by hydrocarbons. So in that case I have to thank Geolog not only for uh, hosting me here but also for providing samples and um, since in this case um, I have received samples uh, with uh, a known amount of hydrocarbons uh, which has been measured uh, by thermal desorption gas chromatography and uh, I measured uh, the um, signal intensity uh, with the Minispec obtaining the results that you can see in the graph uh, <coughs> on the bottom right of the, um, of the slide. So as you can see there is a certain linearity this is of course not as perfect as in the previous uh, samples, but uh, <coughs> the possible causes for this noise uh, are manifold. Uh, one possible cause is that the hydrocarbon contained <coughs> is not uh, uh, of fixed composition, but can have different amounts of, uh, of protons and, excuse me, and uh, of course, uh, we cannot completely exclude the presence of water. What we can instead exclude uh, is the presence of uh, protons uh, contained within uh, the rock uh, uh, composition. But this uh, we will see a little bit later. So this is a first result of possible interest. We can have a measurement of uh, uh, proton content in uh, um, cuttings or uh, core chips.
Okay, so let's now look at what we can obtain uh, by looking more in depth at the NMR signal, not only in terms of intensity but also in terms of oscillations and decay. The oscillations uh, are connected to the chemical structure, which can be uh, obtained. With, um, so this is. Uh, uh, the basis of uh, NMR spectroscopy, meaning that the oscillations can be deconvoluted with a Fourier transform, obtaining peaks uh, that are connected to different uh, um, <coughs> chemical composition in the sample. This is something that uh, we will not discuss very much. Uh, instead, we will concentrate on a decay which is connected to relaxation, is less sensitive to field homogeneity, and can provide uh, information on how the protons we have present in the sample actually move. So, NMR information includes chemistry and dynamics, but uh, what is uh, dynamics uh, in uh, um, a, petro a petrophysical system? I will arrive to it. First, I will uh, uh, just state that the relaxation theory is quite complicated because it starts from a block equations, which are equations which describe uh, the relaxation, which means uh, how the magnetization vector returns to the equilibrium after having been perturbed, and uh, solutions uh, of these equations are, are these ones. Uh, and uh, for now, we'll and, and these are for simple systems. For now, let's concentrate on the T two, which is the um, which is the transverse uh, relaxation, which indicates how fast uh, the magnetization perpendicular to the external magnetic field goes to zero with the passing of uh, experimental time uh, regulated by the um, T2 relaxation. Let's focus on this. So, in presence of single relaxation environment, the decay curve is monomodal. The solution to the block equation is a single exponential. So, as a first approximation, in absence of chemical interaction, the relaxation time depends on constraints. Constraints in a petrophysical environment or in general in the study of porous materials filled with water or with other fluids are basically geometrical. They are basically the pore sides. So, as you can see, on the left we have a typical experiment in which we have used this NMR sequence, you can see in the middle, this is quite uh, uh, technical stuff, to obtain this uh, uh, signal intensity which decays over time. <coughs> the fitting provides a number, a value in milliseconds usually, and the value is connected to the sides of the pore in which uh, the um, molecule is moving. As you can see, values for free water uh, T2 relaxation values for free water are in the range of seconds. Instead, when uh, you reduce uh, the mobility to large pores, to small pores, and finally to bound water, you go down to milliseconds and uh, to microseconds. Actually, uh, below that, uh, actually be below 10 microseconds, let's say, we are in the solid state, uh, which is invisible in most instru uh, with most instruments, and this is why in the experiments I have shown before, I, I'm rather sure that we are seeing the fluids uh, within the rock and not the protons uh, within uh, the rock itself, uh, maybe due to composition, to partially protonated uh, calcium carbonates or other compounds that can be part of a rock. So, as you can see, the literature here is quite uh, uh, historical. <laughs> I mean, this is really the basics of NMR. The definition of this sequence is really the basics of NMR, but uh, applications are quite uh, new and still hot. Especially because, uh, as you can see, the, um, measurement, the measuring power and also the computational power that has been, uh, is, can be, for some applications, quite uh, important. Let's see what happens. Uh, after this very easy experiment, uh, which involves a single porous system, what happens instead if the system is more complex? So going uh, towards a simulation of a real rock. <coughs> what we can see is that uh, uh, since the block equations are linear, 
if you have separates environment the solution is uh, a summation of uh, uh, single exponential decays so as you can see here we have prepared prepared artificially a sample which you can see where you can see the cross section here it's uh, basically we put a porous material outside with this is 10 10 millimeter uh, tube and then we have put a smaller uh, tube inside filled with water and finally an even smaller capillary tube uh, filled with uh, <coughs> uh, filled with another fluid what we have is an NMR decay which can be uh, fitted by a three component uh, function the decay function so it's a summation of three exponential which have different weights 65 28 7 and the weights are proportional to the amount of polymer so you see the big corona upside has the biggest weight then the red and then the other one and the, we have different uh, relaxation times depending on uh, the relaxivity of each of the um, of the environments Okay, so this is again an, an, an um, artificial system prepared uh, to show the theory. What happens when we have a real system? Because, uh, as you can see, in, in real systems, uh, the pores are not always equal. Uh, the pores are not uh, completely full. So you have one environment which is defined by the water absorbed on the pore uh, uh, sides but uh, you have maybe vacuum inside or you can have a, a second environment constituted of, of water which is not interacting with the surface itself so we have to go from a summation to an integral so the solution for interpolating this uh, the um, correct for correct interpolation uh, of um, t2 decay in a real system is not given by a summation of exponential but by a distribution of uh, exponential which is the function at that we would like to know uh, because we can then correlate to the pore size so can this be done? Yes, it can be done. Some people have done it. Here you can see an example uh, done on uh, artificial materials with controlled porosity. Usually these materials are made up by uh, mm, crushing together uh, uh, nan nanometric beads uh, or, uh, or, or by uh, other ways or by templating. Still, as you can see here, the T2 has been transformed into a distribution of, T2, of relaxation times. Let's see yet again. So, a realistic porous system. Here we have a realistic porous system with a porosity of 22%. It's full, it, it was filled with water. Then the um, relaxation was measured by using the, CMP, the CPMG sequence. And then uh, the results were transformed into a distribution using uh, the inverse Laplace transform, which, is a uh, which can be a complicated and uh, uh, computationally heavy uh, method into a distribution, indicating that we have two family of pores in this system, one uh, with higher relaxation time, so more macro pores, containing most of the uh, containing most of the water and a system uh, of smaller pores which contains the, re the remaining 18%. So, um, okay, let's see for example a real application. I hope that until now the idea is uh, maybe clear. And uh, let's see for example a real application. In that case, again, I have to thank Jlog uh, for providing samples. Uh, which have a known uh, hydrocarbon content. Here I have to make another little uh, jump, a conceptual jump, because here we have hydrocarbon content. Uh, we have performed for each depth CPNG experiment. Uh, in this case, we have tried to simplify the problem by, by uh, fitting with a three component, uh, with a three component um, a decay function which provided us for each sample a slow, intermediate and uh, um, 
fast uh, relaxation. The slow and intermediate uh, uh, indicate quite large pores, uh, while the fast indicates very micro pores that are pro possibly not uh, uh, big enough for containing uh, actually hydrocarbons. And we obtained a good correlation with the presence of hydrocarbons and uh, the um, uh, summation of the two different uh, uh, components. Now, here the, the connection for me is quite phenomenological, uh, but uh, uh, it is there. So, the, uh, how to connect the, the presence of pores with the presence of, uh, um, of uh, uh, hydrocarbon? By the way, this is one of the parts of the collaboration that, that I would like to uh, have. Okay, so let's see a few more perspectives after this example. Uh, perspectives include the use of two-dimensional NMR and uh, the separation of components uh, in terms of mobility, of uh, uh, diffusion coefficients. Let's see for ex firstly the uh, multidimensional NMR. In this case, uh, as you can see in this uh, uh, two-dimensional plot, uh, you should imagine that each slice of this plot uh, is uh, in itself a distribution uh, of T2 uh, in taken in uh, different, con in different uh, NMR conditions. What, uh, how can you read these graphs? Um, basically, along the diagonal, you should uh, obtain, uh, with these experiments, the same uh, <coughs> distribution as you obtain with normal experiments. What is outside the diagonal are the so-called cross peaks, peaks that indicate exchange between environments that possess different T2. What I'm saying is that uh, if you see a peak outside the diagonal, for example this one, it means that within the time of the NMR experiment you had physical mobility from one family of pores to the other, which means that this method can not only describe statically the pore, the pore system, but it can also describe the, connect, the connectivity and uh, describe how well one family of pores can uh, communicate with the other. Here is the <coughs> sorry, literature reference. Actually, um, the results here are very clear because if you go and find the paper, it's an artificial system, again made for demonstration, but uh, there are also lots of papers uh, with real systems in which uh, they are able to see the um, uh, movement of molecules from one uh, volume or the other. So, yet another example instead is, uh, uh, here I will not really not go into the theory, but it is possible also to uh, use other techniques, uh, pulse field gradient techniques, uh, to measure the diffusion coefficient of uh, um, each kind of molecules. In that case, it is possible to separate uh, hydrocarbons with water because uh, due to the very different mass of H2O from most uh, interesting hydrocarbons, uh, they move much slower and so um, it is possible to s completely separate uh, the T2 measurement. Here you can see, uh, up here you have the T2 distribution of the entire uh, proton population, which comprises both water and hydrocarbons. And instead here you can see separation. So this is the oil and this is water. And this can give uh, <coughs> interesting information because uh, here it is saying that basically water is confined in two different kind of pores, while oil is, most, uh, is more widespread within uh, this material. Okay, so... Uh, of course, we can also work with dry samples. I mean, if the focus is not uh, uh, the study of the samples as they are, just extracted, but uh, uh, if somebody wants to know, uh, to characterize the porosity of a sample, one can insert the water in a sample. So, how can it be done? By imbibition, easily, or by pressurization. So, the idea is, uh, you take your samples, you put them one day or one, uh, you, first you dry them, then you put them one day or one week uh, within uh, water, or you can just put them in a pressurizer and put all the pressure you want, 10 bar, 100 bar, I don't know how, it depends on how uh, nice, uh, how powerful instruments you have, 
and uh, in this way you can also study in details a rock and uh, see not only the pore distribution but also the wettability but also how uh, well they are connected and so on. Um, okay. So yet another experiment that can be, be done uh, to see to explore rocks uh, with uh, NMR is uh, um, the use of cryoperometry. Now, uh, as I've said before, the solid state, uh, so for example ice, uh, can be excluded from measurement. Actually, it's, you are forced to exclude it with most, with most instruments. <coughs> so what can be done? We can exploit uh, a basic uh, chemi chemophysical property, which is the depression of melting point of confined liquids. In that case, as you can see, there is a difference uh, between the melting point of a confined uh, fluid and uh, the melting point of the bulk fluid, which depends on uh, lots of stuff, which can be summarized in constant by divided by pore size. Okay, so. Uh, how to transform this in a useful experiment? You take the sample, you freeze it to very low temperature, then you slowly increase the temperature and measure signal intensity as a function of temperature. What happens? It happens that at low temperature you have no signal because as I told, fluid uh, ice gives no signal. Then as you increase temperature, the liquid increases and you can see Diff by, 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 uh, by making a derivative of this graph, you can see different families of uh, uh, pores appearing, 60, 200, 500 angstrom, and finally the bulk liquid, and you can obtain this kind of graph here. So this is yet another uh, trick that can be used. This is a little bit more recent, 2001, but uh, it is still not, it is also still hot, I have a paper from last year, no, actually from two years ago, and uh, in which not only uh, they measured by cryoporometry the, pore di the cumulative pore diameter and uh, the pore diameter, the, the derivative pore diameter, but uh, they also performed it with different fluids. Now, this is going to insert yet another variable because if, since they have performed this measurement with different fluids obtaining slightly different results, you see water, cyclohexane, and so on, and still even different results from a BAT absorption, what we can say here, not that the technique is not precise, but that the technique also includes uh, a part of uh, surface interaction of the fluid with the pore. So here we are getting information also on the decoration uh, of the chemistry on the pore themselves. So, um, before going to the uh, next uh, topic, uh, we we'll have to have an idea. Is my time yet over? No, will not. So we are over. We are over. Yeah. We are over. I, I would, okay. So, uh, since uh, we still have lots of time, uh, we can also discuss, uh, uh, since we have already inserted the idea of using the chemistry, uh, of exploring the chemistry, we can, for example, we can also discuss uh, uh, the use of xenon. So, in that case, uh, I have to uh, make you think again to the in beginning, of this presentation to uh, the nuclear spin. Xenon is a gas which has a spin one half. So uh, the same physics that I've described until now uh, can, be, can be used. But in this case, uh, we will be using the oscillations, uh, so um, which can be transformed into a chemical shift using the uh, Fourier transform. Why xenon? Because uh, xenon has a diameter of 0 0.45 nanometers, so it is a very effective probe. It can go basically uh, everywhere. It's a noble gas, so it's not uh, uh, going to react with your sample. Um, it can physisorb, so diffuses in channels and layer, and it can also dissolve in nonpolar phases, liquids, amorphous polymers, and uh, 
prob and surely alkanes. So probably it's going also to, dif to dissolve into hydrocarbons present within the system. The, its most striking feature is a very wide, uh, very wide um, chemical shift uh, range. Uh, okay, this can go to uh, 7,500, which is an incredible number for uh, the few compounds that xenon can make. But even remaining into atomic xenon, which is not reacted, you can go from the 300 of solid to uh, minus 40 in the case of interaction with paramagnetic species. In that case, uh, the technique is a little bit more complicated because you need to uh, put your sample in a glass tube, uh, make vacuum, put xenon inside, and uh, uh, put a high amount of xenon, like five bars, and finally seal it. So this is a kind, of, this is a typical MR tube. In this case, uh, we have some uh, biochar inside, so it's uh, uh, let's say it's a, in the middle between uh, artificial and natural materials because it's char obtained by charring wood. Um, so what you obtain usually is a spectra like this uh, with a chemical shift which is difference between zero and uh, the signal, the position of the signal. Zero is uh, the res NMR resonance of the free gas. Instead uh, the, the shift we will see is uh, mainly depending on confinement. So, what do we have here? We have a, uh, a range of chemical shift which ranges from zero, free gas, to lower and lower values for ex xeno exchange, and then finally to very low value for nano for, for, to very high values for nano confined xenon. So, this has become uh, one of the uh, let's say standard techniques in the characterization of zeolites. Zeolites are crystals, uh, are porous crystals, so the crystallinity is defined by the crystal lattice itself and as such it's very regular and very small. And um, what has been obtained is a general ex expression for the, chemical, for the chemical shift of xenon, which is chemical shift of xenon equal zero, which is the free gas, S, which is uh, the term, that the geometrical term that we will see, X, uh, which is the effect of uh, um, paramagnetic impurities, and uh, delta xenon xenon, which is the effect of uh, xenon interacting with itself. So it's a pressure dependent term. What can be done for the characterization of zeolites? You measure xenon chemical shift at different uh, pressures. You, you back extrapolate to zero, and then you insulate the delta S or delta S plus delta X term. Then delta S term can be transformed into uh, mean free path by use of this equation, and uh, by using mean free path you can uh, uh, measure the sides of the cages in which xenon is contained. So. Uh, I will show you a fantastic example from literature. This is a um, NAA zeolite, uh, which has uh, windows or throats, I think, uh, smaller than, than the xenon atom at room temperature. If the sample is heated, the entire lattice expands and xenon can uh, uh, travel within. Then uh, the sample is quenched and xenon remains trapped in the cages of the zeolite. What happens here is that you see different uh, peaks, uh, different chemical shifts, uh, which uh, are um, uh, associated to different number of uh, xenon atoms uh, within uh, each cage. So take note that uh, here we are seeing basically quantized pressure, because uh, usually pressure is uh, uh, amount of gas divided by volume. In here, the amount of gas is not uh, a large amount, but is one, two, three, five, four, or five atoms divided by the sides. So you have different pressures. Uh, so from this uh, case to this case, you have double pressure because you have two atoms instead of one in the same uh, size. This is quite impressive for me. And um, okay, so density is discretized. Uh, so this is to give the idea on how sensitive the technique is. 
So can this be used also in more interesting systems, mainly mesopores? I would say yes. So I have to specify that we need big magnets for he for this. It's not possible to do on benchtop, but still uh, there are lots of studies uh, going on. I've chosen two very recent ones, 2015 to 2017. Uh, this one from 2017 involves a comparison between cement and shale. So you see very different, uh, um, very different xenon spectra because uh, in one case you have free xenon at zero and nanopore sites which can be resolved. One can use a similar concept as we described before to measure, for example, the exchange rate. So again, we have a technique that can study the accessibility in a different way than water because uh, xenon is a gas, so it's, it's much faster. Uh, is less prone to connecting with the to interacting and being absorbed by the surface, so it's it can give a complementary point of view, and um, heat of absorption 12 kJ per mole. We will see later how this is calculated. Instead, here I found yet another example. In the in this case is a maturation of uh, kerogen. So uh, in this in that case. Uh, we have a comparison in this paper from 2014 15 between um, measurements performed by xenon and MR and measurement performed by uh, nitrogen adsorption. On the right, you can see maybe you are more familiar with nitrogen phase absorption. As you can see, from going from kerogen A to kerogen F, we are going to increase the maturation, and you can see smaller pores and higher total pore volume. So this is what uh, is seen in the system by the well-established uh, nitrogen physisorption uh, technique. What is seen by xenon? By xenon you can see a peak here, basically here only free gas with some kind of bump. And here as you go to a higher maturation, you see the formation of an entirely new peak, which is uh, connected to uh, smaller pores with higher volume. Smaller because it is more on the left, so more higher chemical shift. Let's go on. I don't have m many more slides now. Uh, <laughs> and um, you can see uh, here, uh, some work on real stones uh, that I performed uh, with Professor Simonuti you know, okay, a few years ago. And in that case, uh, um, we worked on uh, low porosity material, so we had to use some tricks. Uh, we used hyperpolarization, which is something that I will maybe discuss later. And uh, in that case, we were able to obtain signal from lots of uh, uh, rocks, uh, uh, actually, we, we could find on the market, let's say, and um, in that case, you can see, for example, that Carrara marble is a very uh, compact material, basically no pores uh, in the uh, detectable by, um, by xenon. Instead, uh, we have other example, like for example, chrysotile. Here I have an image uh, in which you can see a very broad spectrum due to interaction of xenon with a very broad uh, range of environments, uh, also shifted on the, uh, um, well, on the negative chemical shift due to the presence of uh, uh, polar magnetic impurities. You can see chlorite, you can see beola, and uh, other uh, common materials in, uh, in, in, const in the construction sector, which have been studied, obtaining general information on the pore, uh, on their porosity. Um, again, uh, this is really a basic uh, um, information. There are other uh, advanced techniques, for example, also for xenon, we can perform exchange spectroscopy, which means that you have on the diagonal peaks corresponding to the free gas and the absorbed gas, and then as a function of time, you can see here 15 milliseconds, 35 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, the formation of higher and higher and more and more intense cross peaks indicating that exchange is happening. 
So with this technique, not only we can see change happening, but we can also uh, detect it uh, in terms of time scale. So we can see that uh, at one millisecond, there is not uh, enough time. So one millisecond is not enough to have any exchange. Instead, 15 milliseconds is enough for having change, uh, exchange between these two environments. So this is yet another technique, technique that can uh, provide an idea on the connectivity of the pore system. So this is the model, you see, adsorbed phase, exchange, the xenon exchanging between uh, the absorbed phase, free xenon within macropores, and xenon on the outside entirely. Finally, finally, one can also uh, perform variable temperature measurements. Here you can see the spectra changing with temperature. So as temperature increases, uh, you see here this is room temperature, and this is lower and lower. They tend to get farther and farther because, of course, uh, um, as you decrease temperature, you reduce the exchange, so each environment is probed separately. They don't tend to mix up, they don't tend to average it towards zero. What we have done here is uh, to interpolate the chemical shift with temperature, obtaining uh, um, a Arrhenius plot that can be related to the adsorption energy that is, for example, cited here. So by, by measuring uh, uh, variable temperature, we can also uh, measure the interaction of xenon atom with the surface. Please notice that uh, uh, xenon atom is very lipophilic, so the measurement of this interaction can give an idea of the wettability of a surface by uh, oils or fats. Okay, so I hope I, have, uh, I was able to um, at least give a general idea, because the techniques are many and many are very complicated, that various NMR techniques can provide information on a total amount of H content, poor size and distribution, but also on the accessibility and the interaction between different environments. Other techniques that I have not discussed today also allow the study of composition. For example, they are very used in uh, the uh, composition of carbon materials, uh, explaining, for example, how much they are uh, condensed, how much the different uh, aromatic uh, um, compounds are condensed. And uh, uh, yet other techniques allow the measurement of diffusion coefficients. So, uh, of course, uh, I'm sorry that uh, Professor Simonetti could not be here, but I have to thank uh, him for uh, I mean, uh, letting, introducing me to this topic uh, many years ago. I have to thank Geolog and SP for inviting uh, both of us to this presentation. I have to thank uh, uh, our best student, Denise Besghini, for helping us uh, in uh, this project. And especially, I have to thank you for uh, your kind attention. And I hope you uh, liked the talk. And I'm here for uh, questions. Questions? The, the Q&A section is open. Uh, please. <laughs> Yes, sure. Alberto Guadagnini from Politecnico Milan. Thank you. And here you will see that I didn't understand anything okay, oh, with sorry. my questions. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> the point, so I have basically three questions. How do you define, well, hmm. how do you define mathematically the size of a pore? Okay. Which I didn't understand. It was just, okay, maybe it was just me. Hmm. Uh, second, how do you define mathematically connectivity? because I don't know how you calculate it. Okay. And the third one, uh, when you were talking about the contact angle, can you actually detect spatial <coughs> variability of contact angles? Can you quantify them? Because you said um, uh, to have an idea of the contact angle or the wettability. So what does it mean to have an idea? So the third one is, can you quantify it? Okay, so, so uh, let's start from the first. Uh, in, uh, let's go in order. So the um, <coughs> poor sides, uh, uh, you can, def you can uh, do two things. Uh, you can uh, either uh, uh, define pores as uh, uh, spherical pores uh, and uh, um, then 
interpolate uh, everything as a summation of spheres. So uh, we know that this is an approximation, this is similar to what is, for example, done for the measurement of, uh, I don't know, nanoparticles uh, and of particle size. Uh, you measure the particle size in terms of hydrodynamic radius, all the equations are uh, uh, thought for uh, uh, spheres, uh, then you, let's say, um, then basically you have a distribution in terms of uh, equivalent uh, sphere sides. And here similar, this is... Is it similar to the maximum ball algorithm, for example, to a maximum ball concept? Uh, I mean, when you see the, the sphere that contains... Yeah. Uh, uh, not, not really, because uh, um, because in the in the case of hydrodynamic radii, uh, you you are really going to see the maximum uh, size because uh, a bulky item, a bulky object, uh, moves as a as a sphere of uh, the the bigger size. Instead, here it's more an average of the different uh, size. So, uh, real pores. Uh, uh, I mean pores with different sides, uh, with different, uh, um, I mean, pore with a certain shape uh, will be interpolated as a sphere which is not as big as the biggest, uh, yes. And, uh, or you can uh, uh, think in terms of uh, mean free, free mean path uh, in the case of xenon, and in that case uh, uh, you can have solutions for the different uh, uh, geometries. So, for example, uh, from, from the um, mean free path, uh, you can uh, have a pore size for the spherical uh, uh, model and one, for, yes, it's an analytical solution. Okay, then, uh, second question was about co connectivity. So, for in, no, no, connectivity uh, is something that we see phenomenologically. I mean, we can see the amount of uh, uh, molecules that move from one environment to the other. So, uh, in this case, this is, I think, a quite phenomenological uh, view. Mm, so, it is also mediated, for example, by the presence of throats or bottlenecks. This is, uh, I don't know if this, if it is, if this is the direction where you wanted to go. We can go. talk about that later, but I in any case, it's not, uh, for example, defined uh, as a two-particle uh, covariance, for example. We could talk okay, about no, that. So it's more phenomenological. Will, yes, uh, okay. yes, it's more phenomenological because basically we experimentally determine that something uh, is moving from one um, from one environment to the other and in which time. Then uh, this kind of data could probably be analyzed uh, also in terms of uh, uh, correlation function to obtain further uh, details. Well, this is uh, this is a good point. And then finally, uh, no, I'm not sure uh, I've. Uh, um, I wanted to uh, define it in terms of contact angle because uh, I, I was more uh, into the te um, discussing the interaction of uh, molecules, uh, for example, uh, molecules with the surface in terms of wetting, but uh, microscopic wetting. So I ca we can Okay, so, 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 okay. Yeah, so we, can we can define it in terms of, uh, um, for example, uh, adsorption enthalpy. This is something we can do, but to, pr to predict uh, uh, contact angle, uh, especially in a porous system in which the surface is not, uh, uh, is not um, I mean, uh, uh, flat. Uh, okay, well, it, 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 at least it's beyond my, <laughs> my knowledge. No, so I was, uh, uh, was maybe misled by the word wettability. That, that was okay. it. Yeah, that's, oh. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. I have a question uh, related to the size of the smallest sample that you can actually analyze with these techniques. Well, uh, uh, this is a uh, very good question. Uh, um, our our best, uh, I mean, let's say the smallest sample on which we obtained some uh, meaningful results uh, is, uh, I think, 19 uh, milligrams. Uh, but uh, it was uh, a polymer sample. Uh, in that here uh, you will need uh, 19, let's say 20 milligrams uh, of uh, fluid. So uh, if a rock is very dry, you might need uh, quite, uh, quite a lot, uh, yeah, especially considering the different uh, uh, density of rock and, 
so I think that most samples we used were around one gram, uh, of which uh, five to ten percent were uh, uh, proton contained. Uh, proton contained the protons, so five, five, ten percent water or uh, or hydrocarbons. But what about the size of the particles? Uh, I, because I, you mentioned the, the amount of sample. But uh, one, one key point, for obviously for, uh, for people involved in oil and gas, uh, one key point is also the size. Nowadays, uh, we, uh, uh, unfortunately, drillers are using, uh, P, what do we call the PDCs? The PDCs are, are producing, as you know, powder. So the, the size of the cuttings, the size of the, uh, the rock is uh, very small. So the, I okay. think that this could be a limit. Uh, or, because no, the, no. the message, the take-home message is very, is very positive, it's very, <laughs> it's very encouraging. But, uh, you know, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, if there is a really, this could be considered really a new method uh, for evaluating, uh, not for, say, for, uh, for, uh, but, uh, if, uh, for evaluating uh, uh, por porosity of, of uh, cuttings, uh, even if uh, using cuttings, or if uh, there are still limits uh, depending on the size of the, of the, of the cut. Well, so, so the, the upper limit for size uh, for, for us uh, is uh, 10 to 10 millimeter tube. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, the lower limit, uh, the lower limit, this, this is a really difficult question that we have to, uh, this to solve together because um, from my point of view, uh, I also work in nanotechnology, so uh, small uh, is not a problem. I also I often work with powders, which are maybe 10 or 15 uh, nanometer in size, and in that case, uh, for example, I'm uh, going to publish soon, hopefully, a work in which uh, uh, we study the surface of titanium nanoparticles by studying their interaction with water. Uh, what uh, can interfere here is, uh, um, if you destroy, if you, if you powder the sample so much uh, that uh, the external surface that you have created uh, uh, creates, uh, let's say, a, sec a secondary environment uh, which, which is in on itself a, a porous environment. I mean, uh, so I promised that I should not, I would not use the, the uh, no dashboard. Are, are you seeing you me? Yes, use. but then... Use. So, let's see. So let's imagine that this is a porous material. Okay. You could stay like yeah. this. Okay. So if these are one millimeter chunks, here I have porosity, here I have porosity, and here I have bulk. Okay, but the same exact geometry, but if here is one micron, now this is, this is porous, but now this is also porous in a sense. So now, now this becomes a pore. So uh, if, if, you, mm, if your powder is so fine that it constitutes a, seco a secondary uh, porous system, uh, this is something that we have to consider. But then uh, I think that you also have to consider that if you powder to this level, uh, probably you are also, I don't know, uh, extracting uh, uh, interesting fluids from outside or cracking uh, inside. This is something that uh, really uh, is probably depending also on the structure of the rock. But uh, I mean, that probably if, if, um, if I had to give us uh, an idea, if uh, the, the powder is over 100 microns, uh, uh, probably we will not, so 0 0.1 millimeter, probably we don't have problems of a secondary system, a porous system that we have artificially created. We need this one. <laughs> we have also one question from the chat from Vanessa Blaskets, that is, which experiment do you use to separate oil and water in rock samples? Okay, so, it's a pulsed field gradient uh, 
experiment which measures uh, uh, diffusion coefficient. Uh, there is a, this is part of a wide family of experiments, uh, sometimes called also uh, DOSY, uh, Diffusion Ordered Spectroscopy. Uh, we, well, they are, let's say they are related. Uh, diffusion Ordered Spectroscopy is uh, mostly used in um, uh, chemistry to uh, separate uh, uh, complex mixtures because different molecules move at different uh, with different uh, uh, diffusion uh, rates and then uh, you can separate uh, uh, chemical you can separate by mobility and then study the chemistry uh, with NMR spectroscopy here the technique is not really the same it's partially related uh, because you are not separating uh, to measure spectra, but here you are separating them to, me to then measure uh, T2 distributions. The concept is similar, the execution not exactly, but uh, I can send you the, also the literature reference which I presented. I have, I have, if there is a, any question, I have one more if I can. Uh, you mentioned, I know that it is not the, the main topic of this, your talk, mm. but uh, you mentioned the diffusion coefficient, that is a very interesting topic to me. And uh, uh, one problem, one, uh, one key point, uh, I think, is the, the experimental condition for measurement of diffusion coefficients. Yes. Because, uh, you know, the set, uh, 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 for us, for the people in oil and gas, uh, it's important that they you know, we work at high temperatures and high pressures, yeah. and sometimes uh, diffusion coefficients that are measured at a room temperature are meaningless. So I'm wondering if there is the opportunity to apply this type of, of, uh, uh, of methodology also in very complex setups, uh, experimental setups, I mean high pressure and high temperature. So, yes, I, I think so. Uh, I mean. I'm quite sure I've seen people performing NMR in uh, some kind of uh, anvil cell uh, which goes to very high pressures. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, uh, it can be easily implemented, but I'm quite sure that uh, one, can, uh, one could work. Uh, um, now, let's, let, let's try to, to put this <laughs> in perspective. Uh, because when, when talking to geologists, uh, I'm always uh, a little bit shocked when they tell me of the pressure amounts. What is high pressure for you? I, I'm, I'm old, so I'm think, all, uh, th always thinking in, in atmosphere and not <laughs> in, in megapascal. Okay, but no, for, but for me, uh, uh, 800, uh, 700 atmosphere means, or let's say over 500 atmospheres uh, is, uh, is something that is, uh, you know, okay. we are in Poplane. Uh, under our feet, uh, there is the Poplane. The Poplane, uh, you, uh, you have uh, our. Uh, uh, reservoir, the reservoir was discovered, uh, and I discovered oil, are uh, 800, 900 atmosphere. So this is, uh, okay. is, is uh, I would say that this is the, the, top, of the, the top level, but, uh, you know, we are in the order of uh, hundreds of, of atmospheres. Sorry for using atmospheres. No, no, but this is uh, very fair to help, uh, help me think about this. Uh, so I'm quite sure that Te temperature is not a problem, going also to a few hundred uh, of Celsius, uh, I mean 200, 300 Celsius. Uh, pressures uh, over 50 atmospheres uh, in a lab, uh, I mean in an NMR setup, are not always very easy to, to make up, but uh, I'm sure that uh, one can at least approach uh, the desired conditions and then uh, at least extrapolate some results. I'm not sure one can, uh, uh, but I, I've never tried, so maybe some, uh, if I perform a literature search specific on this, maybe I find somebody who did, but uh, to really uh, reproduce uh, the geological uh, environment within an MR instrument, uh, it's probably a bit uh, hardcore. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Yeah. Another question from the chat. If, uh, if there is uh, any demerit, any disadvantage of NMR? Well, uh, uh, no, 
so the, 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 main, uh, the main disadvantage of NMR is, uh, is always, uh, actually NM, somebody says that NMR has three, uh, three problems, uh, except cost. So, <laughs> the, the, so the three problems are sensitivity, sensitivity and sensitivity. So um, the main problem of NMR is this. Uh, so in the case of uh, uh, protons, this is uh, partially offset uh, uh, due to the abundance of protons themselves and due to the fact that they all participate. In the case of Xeno and NMR, uh, as we have seen, one needs to uh, put at least five atmospheres in the sample to obtain signals in a short time or to use some tricks uh, like performing hyperpolarization, which is something that uh, I just introduced here. It's something that uh, is a technique that can uh, bring uh, xenon outside the Boltzmann uh, equilibrium and so allows uh, um, increasing the signal by three orders of magnitude. And that solves the sensitivity problem, but creates other problems because you require a very specific setup. So uh, yes, if I have to say there is a, de a demand probably is uh, the need of sensitivity, which is also connected probably to the initial question on the amount uh, of required, uh, of, the, of the amount required, uh, which means that uh, exp NMR experiments uh, when the amount of uh, um, hydrocarbon is uh, one or two percent can become uh, quite uh, long because of sensitivity issues. So if there are no other questions, first of all, I, I thank again Michele and I leave the floor to the, pres the, chairman, of the, the chairman of the Italian section of SP for the final remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, really thank for this uh, uh, very nice presentation. Actually, it was not just a lecture, it was uh, more of a lesson, uh, very, very full of, of information, very nice. Uh, this is also the reason why we are recording this, because uh, it's something that deserves later study. If one uh, is interested, look back to the, both the words and, and the slides. So actually we are publishing this uh, in a way that will be, uh, let's say, communicated to all the SPE members, but it's, uh, it's part of the value of this initiative. So thank you very much, Professor Michele Mauri. Uh, the uh, next thing I wanted to say is really thank for, uh, to Geolog for what they are doing uh, for SPE and for organizing all these lectures. Actually, Geolog uh, is doing a lot for the Italian section. The same room where we are now, which is a beautiful room, from the video you can't see, but it's a, it's a beautiful room. You just see one side. Uh, it's a room where we are uh, having our board meetings. Uh, so they're hosting in, in any, uh, almost every month. Both Mario um, Chiaramonte and Antonio Caleri are members uh, of SP Italian section since ages. I don't even know since when. They've been chairman, treasurer, and so on. So thank you very much for whatever you're doing uh, for us. Uh, the last couple of things I wanted to say is just because we are finishing the series of these four lectures. Uh, they are and have been, in my opinion, very interesting, even taken separately. But uh, uh, I would just uh, add something more. It's very interesting to look at them all together. They may seem very different topics, but actually uh, we have touched new uh, analytic methods, new measurement methods, new uh, ways to think about the data that you are achieving, so uh, mathematical approaches, so artificial intelligence, statistical methods, uh, real-time and online methods, not only, let's say, offline and laboratories. And this is extremely interesting because uh, it's a value of putting together a number of ideas that uh, are of value taken separately, but put, put together, they are really adding more, more and more value to all our industries. Actually, uh, one thing that I appreciated about this, um, uh, probably I also said the first time about Geolog, is, uh, is actually uh, the effort to put together new services, new products, 
and to give added value to our industries, not just pushing on a cost reduction, which is something that is of value, of course, but also creating new ideas based on putting together something that no one has done before. So actually, I, I really believe that this is the, the way to go for our industry, not just cutting costs, but actually creating added value. And the best way to create added value is combining things that no one have no one has ever combined before. So actually, I think this, uh, this uh, series of lectures, if you read it in this way, is driving uh, a, a road uh, towards our uh, future as, uh, as an oil industry. So really, thank you very much for your attendance, for your attention, and for your support. Now something to eat and drink. <laughs> thank you.